Welcome to our Clinicians in Conversation podcast series, part of the NIHR, the National Institute for Health Research podcast program. In this episode, we are talking about antimicrobial resistance, and you will hear from Professor Andy Ustinowski and Professor William Hope, who are joint national specialty leads for infection at the NIHR Clinical Research Network. They'll be discussing the challenges antimicrobial resistance presents and how the research environment in the UK is uniquely placed to support clinical research in this area. Welcome to this NIHR podcast exploring research into antimicrobial resistance. My name is Professor Andy Yustinoski. I'm an infectious disease clinician and researcher based in Manchester. And today I'm joined by Professor William Hope. Uh, hello, Andy. Thank you. Um, I'm William Hope. Um, I am uh, the Dame Tally Davies Chair of AMR Research at the University of Liverpool. Uh, like Andy, I'm an infectious diseases uh, clinician and spend most of my time um, in AMR research and especially the development of new antifungal and antibacterial agents. Very pleased to be here. Well, it's nice to have you and what a perfect person because I'm going to ask you some questions if that's all right. Um, William, what do you understand by the term AMR, or antimicrobial resistance, and how big an issue is it? So I think, Andy, one of the problems that we have is that people um, understand different things by this term. It's used widely now. Um, in the most narrow sense, um, it's, the, it's when an antimicrobial uh, agent, that's an antiviral, an, anti an antifungal, an antibacterial, stops working. And there might be any number of reasons for that. But that's quite a narrow view um, or, or definition, and uh, it's maybe a more helpful definition as it really was first uh, described by Lord O'Neill in his report of taking a much broader view of the problem. And so um, people say that they don't do AMR research, but when you think about a vaccine or preventing antimicrobial usage, that is, for us anyway, um, evidence of AMR research. So it's a very broad a very broad uh, definition, Andy. And would you think it's fair to say it's a priority, both clinically but also in terms of research? I think that since I've been practicing infectious diseases, dr drug resistance was something that was considered sort of rather unsavory and dirty and an inconvenience, um, but has really transformed in the last 10 or 20 years to the recognition that antibiotics and antimicrobial agents underpin all of modern medicine. They underpin all of the advances in medical therapies for other diseases and advanced surgical techniques. And without these, we just can't treat patients the way that um, or pa pa patients can't receive the, the, the very best care. So antimicrobials are absolutely critical for functioning of our healthcare systems. And, and, and in that, uh, in, in that, by that idea, adequate functioning of our society as well. It's an absolutely fundamental problem. So what's required to address and improve the antimicrobial resistance problem? People are starting to talk about uh, tackling the problems at multiple fronts. In terms of um, human health, I think there's a recognition that um, we need to use antimicrobials precisely and judiciously, or not at all, if possible. Uh, so we need to look after what drugs and antibiotics that we have. We, so we need to steward them. And we also need to uh, develop uh, new compounds to meet the ever-evolving challenge of drug resistance. And we need to have, um, I guess, a, a social and an economic construct by which we can keep managing this problem together. It's not going to be something that's solved. It has to be managed and really we're on the edge of a number of these different things we're really just barely managing we're not in front of the problem anywhere near as much as we should be and what about the development of new antibiotics um, where does that fit into all of this the problem Andy, with development of new antibiotics is there really have not been any development of any new classes in recent times and one of the reasons for that is because well it's very difficult for a start Something that kills a microbe but that doesn't kill the host that that microbe is in is a no small feat. But really, the issue at the moment is 
we tend to assume that antibiotics are here forever and we undervalue them economically and the economic framework or incentives um, to develop new antibiotics are not present at the moment. They're, they're, there's no way that companies um, and investors are willing to put the money in uh, in the first place because of the very poor returns on their investments. So the, the economic market is not favorable for the development of new drugs and that's out of kilter with the sort of unmet um, medical need or the societal imperative to develop new antibiotics. So there are a number of things that are being done to try and fix that and it's very important that, that those, those uh, pr programs are successful. No, I agree. And obviously, it's not all about antibiotics. Do you think we need further advances in research in diagnostics and public health, etc.? Where does that all fit in? So this is where um, taking a much broader view, Andy, of drug resistance is helpful. It's not just about, there's no point spending one or two billion dollars or pounds developing a new drug if it's immediately lost uh, because of injudicious use. Or So we have to learn how to use these new drugs or these new assets very carefully and we have to develop the, the structures around the drugs that help them to be used. So diagnostics is one uh, example, um, not using antibiotics through vaccines or public health measures. So having clean water and safe food is a, another example of that, but also learning how to use these drugs, using them for the benefit of not only patients, but populations as well. We, we tend not to do that in a very refined or sustainable or resilient manner um, uh, because we've always had the option of, of, of getting another drug. And so that, th those options are starting to run out and we need to develop all of these other tools uh, and strategies around drugs. And I, I, I believe we probably need to encourage a better understanding of the whole issue around antibiotic use, antimicrobial resistance, etc., by the whole group of different people, whether that's patients, public, healthcare practitioners, healthcare services, etc. Um, would you agree? Yes, I think that that is true. So people don't understand how profound this problem is. They understand about superbugs and they understand that you shouldn't have antibiotics for a viral sore throat. This, this is a problem that is as fundamental um, to, to the climate emergency. It cuts across all facets of our society and we need much better engagement from the public and policy makers to help solve this incredibly complex problem. So the key area I want to explore is really what are the NIHR's plans and what can listeners potentially do to contribute? The NIHR has the advantage of being a, a large connected network so it can operate at scale. It's managed to do that very successfully in the uh, recent pandemic um, by operating together. Um, using a variety of innovative approaches, um, such as platforms, and they could be adopted for, or we're planning to adopt them for uh, drug resistance, um, research into drug resistance. The NIHR has the most fantastic um, linked expertise in terms of its data surveillance and its microbiological and clinical expertise for the development of new antibiotics. And it has the most astounding um, uh, expertise in these other things that we've been mentioning, so vaccine research and diagnostic research. So we're incredibly well placed to um, tackle AMR in the, in the broader sense, Andy. And I think our unified healthcare system is a definite advantage to doing research in antimicrobial resistance. Um, what are your views on that? So the, yeah, the UK is uniquely placed, isn't it, to um, this is not about um, a zero-sum game. It's not about a winner-takes-all. It's that that we um, and antibiotics and antimicrobials are about what it takes for us all to live safely together, and that means we all have to work together to do that. It's not about individual rights. It's not about um, the individual always winning. It, there's a trade between individual rights and uh, you know resilient systems or countries with resilience. Um, that can can use these drugs for the here and now, but also have drugs for tomorrow. Um, and so I think the UK seems to be well placed in terms of providing leadership for those sorts of issues. No, I agree. I think we've got the the structures, we've got the um, 
the baseline, and then all the learnings that we've had from the COVID pandemic, which we can bring into this to really exploit uh, new ways of approaching antimicrobial resistance, whether that's looking at antimicrobial agent development, um, which could potentially be accelerated, um, whether it's looking at diagnostics and pathways and ultimately health economics and, and implementation science. There's a huge amount that we potentially could do. And the learnings from COVID have included, as you've mentioned, um, platform studies, but there's a huge number of other adaptive trial designs that we could in innovatively use to address antimicrobial resistance. Um, so if we have someone from commercial pharma or someone from academia listening here, um, what would you say to them in terms of what they can do, um, what we can do, uh, and how to approach us in the UK to bring their studies and their products to us? Well, Andy, I, I think one thing about the field at the moment is that um, every everybody's issue um, is different. It's actually strikingly different in terms of um, whether that's a diagnostic or a new drug. That might be a traditional agent or it might be a non-traditional agent or it might be a vaccine. Um, so I think that both of us are um, here to work with companies um, on a one-to-one -one basis. And so we would very much value um, direct contact uh, where we can talk about those issues and either direct people to where we know that there are expertise or if not work together to develop new pathways to get uh, their, those products advanced through uh, clinical clinical uh, research uh, in the UK. Absolutely. I mean, that, those one-to-one -one conversations are often the most important thing. The other portal into the clinical research network and the UK generally is the business development and marketing um, subset of the CRN. And so that would be a good port of call um, either um, directly to, to William or myself or to the BDM uh, part of Clinical Research Network. And they can chaperone and assist and support someone uh, in viewing whether they come to the UK and subsequent from that. So I think there's exciting times ahead of us. Um, I think there's an awful lot that we can do. I think this is really a major focus and it's something that I think we will do a lot in and we would love to work with people, whoever they are, who have similar interests or who have potential products that we can bring in to this whole arena. Um, any last comments from you, William? Well, Andy, I couldn't agree more. So we're here to help. We're here to work with people. We take, a, of course, a strong national view, but we also have uh, well-established international links um, and um, to very much take a global view of this problem. We're, we're here to help. Great. Well, lastly, thank you so much, William, for spending the time to talk to us. And for the listeners, for listening, I hope it's been useful for you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. To find out more about how the NIHR supports AMR research, visit the NIHR website. This was an episode of the NIHR Clinicians in Conversation podcast series. Thank you for listening.